let's get real. Welcome to TBC Today. This podcast features friends in and around the Triad Baptist Church community. Hear encouraging real life stories from our weekly guests and inspiring insights from our host, Pastor Rob. To learn more about Triad Baptist Church in Kernersville, North Carolina, visit us online at tbcnow.org. All right, well, welcome back to this episode of TBC Today. We're excited uh, to be back again this season, and we've got some special guests with us today. Uh, we have a missionary couple with us, Pastor Rob, who you know pretty well, mm-hmm. and I know their family as well, so that's pretty interesting. Uh, Adam grew up in France as a missionary kid. His wife, Faith, also grew up in, as, in a missionary family. And currently, they are plan, uh, church planners uh, with ABWE in a predominantly Muslim part of northern Togo. So that's what we want to talk about today. So, Pastor Rob, are you ready? I'm ready. Let's get real. <laughs> we'll get the timer going. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the sands of time, we call them. That's when y'all get going too long. I like yeah. it. Mm-hmm. Those preachers. Well, listen, uh, we actually have a long history uh, from our lives. Uh, his grandfather was instrumental in me going to Piedmont at the time where they ended up later when I was a teacher. But uh, your grandpa was in Williamboro, New Jersey. My uncle would attend that same church. And then uh, your dad, or your grandpa took over at Piedmont. And so through that, then your dad went there, Evan. And uh, when he went there, he graduated. So I was just coming in as a freshman and he was already gone. We went up to Grace. Mm-hmm. Well, then I asked one of the professors at Piedmont who was pretty well known, his name was Dr. Bowman, um, where should I go to seminary? And he told me, Bob, he always called me Bob. He never called me Rob. <laughs> and, and I said, my name's Rob. He'd still call me Bob. And he said, uh, there's only two seminaries you can go to. And I really thought there's only two seminaries in the country at the time. He said, it's either Dallas Theological or Grace Theological. And so Grace Theological was 14 hours from my house and Dallas was 20. And that was a big part of the decision. Uh-huh. I didn't want to wow. be that far from home. Mm-hmm. And then that's where I met his dad. I met his dad up at seminary. He was already probably two, three years into the CHM. I was going up for my D-men, and we started doing things together because of our connection back to Piedmont. We sang together and did all kinds of things like that. That's really cool. I didn't know I I could sing. No, I didn't know you could sing. I didn't know either. That's really cool. I I knew some of it, but it's very interesting to hear all that. That, We called ourselves the Indiana Eight because we were all in (laughs) seminary there. And uh, then uh, I I think your dad went to – did he go to France right then? Yeah. Okay. Well, pretty much straight from there. He didn't even yeah. finish. So you weren't even born yet, were you? I was. I, I was born in Warsaw, Indiana. Okay. In 1983, so I don't know what year. You and Allie was born in 1985, okay. uh, Warsaw, Indiana. Right. Yeah. yeah. Who was your doctor? Ooh, I don't even remember that. <laughs> you don't remember no, that? I might not want to. I was, they were living in that funeral home at the time, right? Mom and dad were. That's right. Sure. That's so. right. What a wow. great history, though. Mm-hmm. So our connections go pretty deep in our yeah. roots, and it's it's just exciting. And then I had him for classes, of course, and they barely got through both of them. But <laughs> so we knew, hey, what was he like as a really professor? It was at least a B. We don't want to go there because it might yeah. scare people. He was so amazing. We loved his classes, yeah. but you hated to look at your grades, though. Yeah, so. that's, that's, that's what I've heard. Loved his he has that reputation, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I remember I had, you hanging uh, out with Ocean. You hanged out with that little girl, Ocean. Mm-hmm. Oh, so yeah. And you guys were always oh, talking Ocean. together. I remember yeah, that. Ocean, you were in class together. Yeah, yep, yep. But anyways, it's so cool to have you. And now, you know, your lives have, man, you literally have grown up and yeah. totally different. But that's what we want to kind of connect with you about is just how you got to where you are today. Mm-hmm. So kind of start with your callings as far as like mm-hmm. you're growing up in France. And I don't really know much about your faith, but I'd yeah. like yeah. to hear all that. Okay. Yeah. So going from Warsaw, Indiana, my parents were uh, straight missionaries with EBM back then. And they went to, to France in 1987. And so in 1987, I went straight into kindergarten, in French kindergarten, public school. And so my whole childhood, all the way through 12th grade in French public school, through the French public school system. And so French is really my first language. So when I was coming to Piedmont, it was really tough on me. (laughs) But I got saved at a young age. My dad would do a Wednesday morning Bible study uh, with the kids of the community. And uh, I got saved in that Wednesday morning Bible study, committed my life to missions or to his service at 13 got baptized, and then one year when we came back to, to on furlough, I went to Marywood Christian Camp. And at Marywood Christian Camp, before that, I really wanted to be a professional baseball player. I wanted to play for the Atlanta Braves. I was a really good pitcher in France. I didn't know I would stink, probably, <laughs> in America as a pitcher. I would not be a good pitcher here. But uh, that was my what I felt like what God wanted me to do. I wanted to be like wow. Oral Hershizer. You remember him? Yeah, right? sure. A Christian pitcher. Pitcher. But, uh, when I went to Marywood Christian Camp, I really felt like God was tugging on my heart, said, you can be your own servant. You don't have to be like your dad or your granddad. Because I was really scared or intimidated 
that I had to be like like them. And they're superstar Christians and missionaries and servants of God. And so I was scared to be that. And I didn't know what I could be for the Lord or what he wanted me to be. So at that camp, I just committed my life to Christian service and said, I want to serve you, Lord, my whole life. So that took me to Piedmont um, in 2001 and uh, quickly met Faith. And we started dating, actually, in the, yeah, uh, in the winter. And, uh, but that whole time at Piedmont, serving on the drama team with the Piedmont drama team, and traveling with a corral really developed a love for ministry. Wow. And so, did you get uh, you started dating your freshman year? Mm, uh, she like would say the, no, but no, like we weren't official. We <laughs> right. weren't official. That, that Piedmont Bridal College until set up. 2002, our second, our fresh, yeah. our sophomore year. Sophomore year, yeah, yeah that's mm-hmm. when we were. But you kind of were hit like sweet on each other, but yeah. maybe you didn't really start. Yeah. She actually broke up with me before the drama team <laughs> uh, because she said, I have to focus on the drama team. Really That's spiritual, true. right? That's true. Uh, That's true. I, asked, was good. I prayed that God would take the feelings away, and he it did. Was a, it was a good commitment. And then he I took told away him, the feelings? He took away my feelings for Adam, and I was like, yay, thank you, Lord. And I, and I told Adam, and he was like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> and he got sick for like two days, but, you know. But then it all worked out. It all worked out. It all worked out at the end of the drama team. and but really the commitment to missions came throughout Piedmont time wow. with the missions conferences and the, and the teaching there. And so we, we together uh, kind of learned how to, to see the world through different eyes there because we thought we were missionary kids. But that's just my story uh, to that point until we met each yeah, other. Yeah, catch us up there mm-hmm. with your story. Okay, so my parents were missionaries in Colombia. And then and we also spent some time in Mexico and Paraguay. I actually graduated high school in Paraguay. I got saved again at a young age. I was five Mm -hmm. and just growing up in a Christian home, which was great. But, like, it wasn't really my my own. I mean, I think I was just kind of living off my parents' righteousness. Like, my parents are missionaries, so I'm good enough and whatever. But uh, as a senior in high school, I dedicated my life to Christian service. But um, definitely not missions. I was like, not that I was bitter. I liked my mission life. But I was like, I've been there, done that. So Mm -hmm. serve my time. I'm good. I wanted to do Christian drama all over the world, and my parents tricked me into going to Piedmont because they had been to Piedmont in the 80s, and and they were like, just go for one year and get some Bible, and then you can go wherever you want to go. I'm That's like, okay. Truth. Yeah, I didn't realize that I was going to get sucked in. And so I did. The first missions conference at Piedmont kind of confirmed that, mm-hmm. um, that I hadn't been completely available to God because I was, like, holding back that missions aspect. And so when I finally surrendered that, I was like, oh, man, he is calling me into missions. Okay, <laughs> all right. So then I just started down that path. Mm-hmm. And um, I was in the Mission Fellowship Chapel one time. Ron Washer came, spoke. He's from ABWE. My parents were with ABWE, so I was kind of kind of grew up in that family, but I had never met him before. And um, he, I told him my boyfriend and I had to go on a mission trip that next summer, and we want to go somewhere in Africa. Um, he speaks French, I speak Spanish, maybe with youth, maybe I'm interested in medical missions. And he was like, Togo, go to Togo. I was like, okay, I don't know anything about Togo, but sure. So we went in between our junior and senior year to Togo for six weeks, just the two of us, and did a lot of things in the southern part of Togo, and to VB, did like VBSs. Mm-hmm. I got to see a lot of the hospital ministry, and it was great. We loved yeah. it, but we weren't thinking that that would be the place for us to serve because they already had church planters down there. The, the Togolese were planting churches in the south, and that's how it should be. So we were like, I don't think they need us. Mm-hmm. And then um, when we joined ABWE in 2007, after we were married in 2005, um, they they said, oh, well, wait, no, actually, we're, no- we're opening the north of Togo, which is Mongo, and it's all Muslim, and Adam really wanted to work with Muslims, mm-hmm. and... And they're, they're opening a hospital, so it was like, okay, all these pieces fit with what we wanted to do for our ministry. So that's when we joined on with that in 2007. Yeah. So really, even when you were there, you started to feel a burden already for Togo, even though it was going to end up in the north? Right, yeah. yeah which, and then we were, <laughs> we were, again, tricked. Man, I was tricked again. They're like, you don't need to take a survey trip because you were already in Togo, so you know what it's like. But they didn't tell me. The north is so, so different mm-hmm. from the south. This, I mean, not only physically – the, the climate, the yeah. landscape, but also just spiritually, because in the South, it's a lot of animism, but mixed with Christianity. Mm-hmm. In the North, it's just Islam mixed with animism yeah. and very more oppressive. like desert light. I mean, it was... There's no Christianity then in a sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah was it a was... a very oppressive place. What was drawing was so you to, toward working with the Muslim, Muslim people? I think, for me, the biggest part was growing up in France, in the Paris area. Mm-hmm. Most of my neighbors were from... 
an Arabic background. So a lot were from Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, Turkey. And so my best friend actually growing up was a, a, in my neighborhood, and we played baseball together too, was a, an Algerian Muslim. And my whole childhood never saw him come to know Christ. So it was a long time of me sharing my faith with him. And I'm still burdened for him to this day. His name is Kareem. And so I always had that as a burden on my heart. Um, but a lot of those you know, Near East countries and those Northern African countries yeah. are very hard to get into. And for a young family, it would be really hard. But it just fit perfectly. A lot of those African, West African countries, if you go to the northern part of those countries, almost all are predominantly Muslim. Wow. And so that's just how I developed, uh, I think, the, the desire to go to... So you even have a feel for that? Like you have a feel for what it takes to reach a Muslim as far as building yeah. friendship? It's mm-hmm. a long yeah. haul, isn't long it? Haul, right? Long haul, Yeah, like process. we have a missionary in Mozambique, and I'm amazed. They do goat farms, and they do all kinds of farms yes. just mm-hmm. to develop the relationship. Yeah. so important. Yeah, it's so and important. It's like a backdoor discipleship mm-hmm. almost. Yeah. yeah. The people don't realize they're being discipled, just like mm-hmm. you guys were tricked to go into yeah, missions. Exactly. <laughs> they were tricked into gospel. Well, it is. And it's a so time consuming, but it's all about developing those deep relationships. That way, one day, when they know they've got to turn to Christ, they know they've got to turn to the Bible for truth and for, they know that they've been trusted and they can trust you. Yeah. And so they ask, they ask those questions to you. And it's mm-hmm. really important for us. And you there. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, and with the with the radio program, which is a, a big ministry that we're involved with, one of the biggest ministries that we're involved with over mm-hmm. there is with the Hope Radio. Hope Radio is listened to by, I mean, even the imams in the town come and visit Hope Radio and say, oh, we just listened to that program. That was a really good program. And you're like, yeah. okay, let's, let's go a little deeper. But Now, I'm not, I hope I'm not saying anything to violate any kind of policies there, but like even your strategy was to hire people that were Muslim. Yeah. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. And Yeah. And our intention really is to show that to work for a Christian organization, you do not have to be a Christian. Because I think part of the misunderstanding a lot in religion is that it's all about the clique. You know, if you if you become a Christian, you will work for Christian. Almost like Freemasons Muslim, or something. Yeah, you, know, you're like, you will be okay. part of the Muslim community and people will buy from you. And so part of our intention is to show that if you have a gift or a talent, uh, it, it can be used, right? I mean, some of our employees that we have, like even our radio director is a Muslim. He's my best yeah. friend in Africa right now, uh, Ali, and he's our radio director wow. at a Christian radio. He doesn't, he doesn't choose the programs that go on right. there. Right, he's like an HR kind of more behind the, the scenes administrator. Yeah. But he helps, and he helps translate the gospel. Mm-hmm. And he, I mean, he has spoken it. He has spoken the Bible on the air. And you're like, how does that not penetrate? I mean, Satan has just blinded these people. Mm-hmm. And I think for him, it's a lot of pressure from the family because he is part of the royal family of the city. And um, it's just historically Muslim. And if he did ever choose Christ over mm-hmm. Islam, uh, his life would be destroyed. Yeah. Well, why would an imam want to listen to your radio station? Yeah. I think the, the major <laughs> so, part about it is just that we, we are presenting truth. And they're so often, they're so confused by what's being communicated within Christianity even. You know, it's, yeah. it's very confusing, this prosperity gospel. That's mainly what they're hearing and seeing. They're not seeing true evidence of faith in Christians a lot of times. And so one of the, I think, the amazing things we have is to just go through the Bible topic by topic or verse by verse and, and able to communicate truth just chronologically from scripture and that's that's very important to them and it's not something they don't believe in yeah. um, but it is to us it's it, it has been effective and I think my my mom and dad have moved out there recently within the last six years and having him on board where he's got a lot more theological background and has a writing talent yeah. that's amazing French even to write very good quality programs is, is important and media is one of those sources that if you can get to that point where you're producing media and the government's approved it, then you are very well respected and trusted because wow. it's And also powerful. information of any kind yeah, is so valuable there. Here in America, we we hoard our possessions, but we give information freely. Over there, they hoard information and give their possessions freely. So yeah. any kind of free classes or free seminars, people want to go mm-hmm. because that's information and we're willing to give it away. And so even... Even if it's Christian things on the radio, they're willing to listen because that's to them like, oh, let's just add more knowledge and add more information. Mm-hmm. So what are a few of the major differences and then the major similarities between Christianity and Muslim? Yeah, I mean, I some, think... Go I was going to say some of the similarities would yeah. be like Old Testament stories. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They have, they know 
a lot of the Old Testament prophets. I mean, they believe Adam and Eve, mm-hmm. Moses, Abraham, of course, who sacrificed Ishmael instead of Isaac. And yeah, I think one of the one of the major differences is just how ritualistic it is. Too, mm-hmm. it's all about those five pillars for them and how how much faith or faithfulness you put into those five pillars of Islam and your prayer time, your fasting, mm-hmm. your going to Mecca, all those things give you ranking in the religion. Mm-hmm. And so those that's a major difference since we're in Christianity, we're all one right. in Christ. And so that that's very evident in the community mm-hmm. and it's very evident in our church and in our in our practices too. So really like uh, the work system, it's almost it the works. Yeah. Completely. And so as a result of that I mean, do you have to counter that, or do you just kind of let it play itself out in terms of what you guys teach? Yeah, I mean, with, with our Muslim friends, we do let it play out. Uh, we want it to be seen, you know, heard also, but seen in our own lives of what's evidence of what the gospel has done for us. Um, it is hard because that freedom in Christ sometimes does not make much sense, right, to those who have practiced and tried to find favor before God for so long and hope that there was a way, like, just that key to open the door. Mm-hmm. But it is difficult for them to see that just, yeah. you know, trusting in Christ as a Lord and Savior. What about you? Is it difficult for you guys, if you're the only really faces they're seeing to live out Christianity, and there is a real freedom in that, yet would you feel pressure? Do you feel any kind of pressure? Like, you know, yeah. we got to get this right in front of them, or <laughs> yeah. we're going to yes. blow the gospel. A lot of pressure. Yes, especially when there's, like, team conflict between the missionaries. We're like... Guys, we're we're trying to represent Christ to them, and if they're seeing conflict between us, like it it does not mm-hmm. do any favors to the gospel. Mm-hmm. So I think it's it's a lot of pressure we feel on pressure. us, and then we're also just try physically to live out um, in ways that is that is not going to put them off of the gospel. So like I wear dresses to my ankles and skirts to my ankles, and I wear sleeves, things like that. That mm-hmm. and Adam, you know, just the way that we dress is trying to be sensitive to them and just show them that yeah, we don't yeah while we have respect. freedom. Yeah, yeah, we were, have Carolina barbecue on there. <laughs> we don't we don't eat bacon except for, for it's secret in our home. <laughs> you have to secretly oh, eat it. When they smell it, though. Well, hey, we actually, one time some, one of our friends did come over. We have the Togolis in and out of our house all the time. And one of our friends came over, and Adam's like, hey, Faith, give him a bowl of soup. And I was like, Adam, I put bacon in it. You can't have it. I was Trouble. like, give him, here's some bread. Here's some bread he can have. Oh, no. uh, it, is, it is challenging. I think, you know, those things are just one, part of the – I don't know the struggle, but mm-hmm. it's part of what we try to just take away all those obstacles that could be a hindrance for the gospel. And it, it's hard. You can't take away all of them, you know, because mm-hmm. we live such a different life um, in Christ, but also just as Americans, right? Yeah. I mean, we live yeah. a different life. So but we try to take away all those obstacles just to give full access to the gospel. Have you What's, ever had to, like, for the uh, conflicts that you guys had internally, have you ever had to go back, say to anyone in your staff or your employees, Hey, we blew it. Yes, mm-hmm. yes, actually. <laughs> Many at times. the radio station, yeah, things that have happened at the radio station, and just come back to the to, to the employees that work there and just say, "Look, we're sorry. Like this should not have happened, and you know, forgiveness has been asked mm-hmm. of and received." And so, and they, yeah, to try to. They very example. rarely see forgiveness and di- displayed in in Islam. It's not the way you you know. That's not the way you portray mm-hmm. what do you yourself. do in islam it's all about vi- vindication or revenge well, it's such an honor shame yeah. culture there so they don't understand the the guilty versus innocence it's like whether they have honor or whether they have shame so if they can do something wrong but as long as they're not caught it's not really wrong like mm-hmm. they're not guilty and then and people can take them out of that shame lift them out of that shame if somebody of honor lifts them out of that shame then it's like they're done and it's okay or if they just sweep things under the rug, as long as nobody notices, They're okay too. it's okay, mm-hmm. yeah. Now, in your situation where you said, hey, we're sorry about that, how did that go down for them? Like, how did they interpret, or did they ever never tell you how they felt? <laughs> I think it was hard for them to interpret it because it wasn't something they were used to, and then they never really saw how we were maybe doing the honor-shame part of it too, where, where we didn't have a chance, you know, to necessarily show them that we were bringing this person or these people back up to honor but I think it was very well received because it, it never seen, you know, true bearing of heart like that of, of what comes with forgiveness and asking for forgiveness and receiving forgiveness. So I think to this day it does speak volumes to what has happened. But I think in general, you know, even within our the Christians, 
that we have that are now, you know, Muslim background believers that have come to know Christ. It's one of the big things we try to work through yeah. is, is what are those things that the, the Muslim people are going to see of true evidence of a saved person, someone who has been changed completely. So, What's, what is the most difficult part of your ministry? Mm. Oh, man. Boy, Wait, this is one. only a half-hour show. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think for me the hardest part has been that um, I've had a difficulty with uh, the, um, the divide that's there economically and socially. Mm. Um, uh, where we are is, is out in the middle of nowhere. So education even is has never been on their radar. So they've, they've very few people have sent their kids through school system, maybe third grade, you know, and, Mm -hmm. and so I, you know, love to teach and preach and and sometimes it's very hard because the French level is so, so shallow, but then that also plays in economically where uh, they're, they're, they live, they're living on $80 a month is minimum wage there. And so we're worlds apart from that. Even if we were to lower ourselves Mm -hmm. to their standard, it'd be very tough. And so it has, to me, it has come to even hinder my proclamation of the gospel because I've felt like many years that it has, imp- it has made it um, just an attraction for mm-hmm. them to come to know Christ and for me to share the gospel with them and then receive it mm-hmm. just to be um, maybe accepted or find a job. Well, maybe. yeah, because so, you just question motives, right? Yeah. Once you get going, like, it's are they actually interested thing. in the gospel or... Are they just thinking that we're going to give them a job? Because yeah. that happens all the time. It does. But we have to come to the conclusion that, like, it's not our it's job not our, to question the mm-hmm. motives. Like, that's the Holy Spirit's job. Like, we just have to present the gospel. But it does. It, it has created just a dilemma because um, it kind of plays out in a lot of aspects yeah. of life um, when you build those relationships. And because it's a patronage culture, too. Mm-hmm. So it's honor shame, but it's also a patron, like, client. And we are the patrons whether we want to be or not, because we are foreign and we are mm-hmm. educated and wealthy over there. So even if it was a Togolese person, like they are the patron, so they always have the place of honor. If you mm-hmm. come to their house, you're in the best seat. And that's not what, as Christians, that's not what mm-hmm. we want to do. You know, we're like, no, like, yeah. let's humble ourselves. Let's, we are all equal, but that's not the culture at all. And so to wrap our minds around that, that it's not a sin or that's, that's not mm-hmm. wrong. It's just totally different than our culture. So for us to take the best seat is show actually showing them honor that we're accepting their honor. Mm-hmm. It's very complicated. Yeah, it's complicated. So you have to do it at some level. You, you have you to. But you then have. other times you let down your hair or you can't I mean, even yeah, with some of the people that we've gotten really close to, mm-hmm. they know that we're not comfortable with that and that we would rather just be on the same mm-hmm. level as them. But as much as we want to, it's never, we're never going to, yeah. they're never going to see us as equals as much as we yeah. would like them it's to. It's been a challenge for me because building even close friendships has been tough because, you know, uh, it's just we're, we have very few things in common. Right? If you're not even a Christian, it's even harder. But I think it's just been developing those ideas yeah. in my mind of what, what a friend is and what it looks like uh, to develop those relationships. So that's been a struggle for me in ministry there over the last 11 years since we've wow. been there. And I've really realized it in the last three or four years just how much it plays because I'm, I'm involved in the community deeply and with all the higher ups all the way mm-hmm. down to the, you know, to the people in the What in is the, market, so. the best method for sharing the gospel in mm. that culture? It's a good, I mean, I think there's so many different opportunities that arise to like sneak it in there. Mm-hmm. I mean, you even tell about your dentistry. My dentistry I, should, I will tell about dentistry in a second, but like, even if, when you go yeah. to the, a funeral mm-hmm. or a baptism, I mean, because yeah, those huge. things are all the time. When a, when a baby is eight days old, they have their Muslim baptism, and that's, like, where they give their name. And so to go to all of these ceremonies with them and to share those life experiences and then just to say, you know, the funerals or whatever. Adam even mm-hmm. preached a funeral one time that we just showed up at a village, and they're like, oh, this person died. Can you preach? And it was like, okay. <laughs> wow. I mean, it was yeah, that was, like, our first term, too. It was, but it is. Yeah. It's like, Okay. This is the hope that we can have in heaven, that if you know Christ. But what he's talking about for me, for my dental ministry, so I'm not a trained hygienist or dentist, but I am over there because some dentist came out and taught me for a couple weeks. And so now I get to pull teeth and clean teeth, and it's really fun. But um, So I do it for all of the hospital employees, their families, any of our employees or families, the military base who's across the street, we get them in, mm-hmm. any government officials, any of the health department, oh anybody, soul, yeah. basically. And while I'm all up in their mm-hmm. mouths with my hands in their mouths, <laughs> they're not going to stop me. They can't do anything about it. So I'm like, hey, you know what? 
I see that you you brush your teeth pretty well, like right in the front where everybody can see, but back in the back, like where people don't see, it is really bad, and you can't get this off on your own. Isn't that just like humans? We dress so nice on the outside, and we clean ourselves, but our heart is so She's full of sin. But there's only one person who can take that sin away, and that is Jesus. So I, she I, goes all I don't hold awesome. back when they're in the chair. I mean, that's not that's something great. that I would say to the people in the market or yeah. whatever normally, yeah, yeah, but yeah. when they're in the chair, mm-hmm. and I'm just yep. going and going and going, I, I just lay it straight out there. Don't you want to serve Christ? Exactly. <laughs> either, yeah. either, do you want She's to go to heaven or do you want me to pull this tooth for you? <laughs> That's amazing. And so you're pretty much practicing dentistry. Yes. It basically. <laughs> That's incredible. You're pulling the military teeth out yeah. too. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, I yeah. have. That's incredible. The, the yeah. commander of the military base. I clean mm-hmm. his teeth regularly. And she goes into town and visits with people and sees some of our friends. And then I'm like, eh. You need to come see us on Wednesday. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I can take care of that for you. Please come see me. And then they, when they That's leave, great. they're like, oh, my wife can look at me now, you know? Oh, yeah. They're really some, proud. I mean, Muslim that. men who don't <laughs> show affection to women at all, but there was one man. I mean, his, his teeth were so, so black and dirty. And after, like, two and a half hours, he had a white smile. And he mm-hmm. saw himself in the mirror, and he was like, oh, madam, oh, madam. I can smile with my friends now. I can laugh with my friends. And he's like bowing to me and hugging me. And I'm like, okay, it's that's okay. So cool. it's okay. Uh, that's that is massive cool. Ministry. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Well, what do you think here? Uh, well, I'd love I, to keep I want going. To know, well, I want to know, though, do you have any funny or embarrassing stories? Oh, my. <laughs> Again, it's only a 30 minute Anywhere show. from your prep to, to <laughs> going on the mission I field to ministry. The witch doctor, sorry. The, oh, okay. Everybody so, has a witch doctor story. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> so the, our first year of ministry yeah. there. We're newbies, but one of our teammates uh, that was retiring, actually, 40 years in Togo, uh, they turned over kind of all the church planting work mm-hmm. to us in the ministry. But then we also became senior missionaries for a lot of new missionaries coming. This one couple came out. Um, they were doing mainly construction. Mm-hmm. They moved into a house, and we were it was a temporary two weeks. House. They had, and we had to try to find them a house. And so we went one Sunday after church. We dropped off the kids at the house. And we were going to drive around town. Like literally houses. just were like, kids go yeah. inside, we're leaving. Yeah. So we, we came back to the to the house after visiting a bunch of places. Nothing was good. But then the kids come out and like, we've been robbed. People, somebody <laughs> broke into the house. There's a knife out there in the corridor where they were trying to cut up something. And it was a bunch of things missing. We'll come to find out there was also 500,000 francs missing, which is about $1,000 out of their underwear drawer. <laughs> they had kept it in there because they were going to use it for rent. Well... That, that time I said to Nate, we need to tell this to the community because I've never seen this happen. And a lot of our missionaries said that too. So I told a couple of my buddies in town, I said, if you see, if you hear anybody spending like big bills a lot, call me, let me know. Well, that evening, one of my friends, Abbas, said, hey, I know somebody that can help you find the person who did it. I was like, really? That sounds good. <laughs> we are new missionaries. We're, new We're missionaries. not even a year in. <laughs> I'm like, okay. So I was like, okay. I asked my friend Nate, is that, is that all right? Should we go to this guy? He's like, yeah, let's do it. So we went. I thought it was like, you know, some mafia dude that was going to just find it. <laughs> <laughs> I get to the house, and I explain the situation, and I tell him what happened. And uh, and he's like, okay, that sounds good. I think we can do something. He pulls his bag out from the ground, starts throwing some beads and bones on the table. <laughs> <laughs> and like doing some incantation me and him were like stand, stood up scared to death i was like no 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 we don't need we don't do that kind of thing and so then my my friend nate was like you brought me to a witch yeah, doctor that's what that's and held that against me to this day because the guy was great. practicing was witchcraft was gonna yeah, do us, sure. uh you know Abbas so, didn't sell him we're going no to witch I, I did not know what i was getting into <laughs> Did you, did you find the friends? Yep, though. He literally thought it was a good yeah. way was to like, go. Yeah. He, that's the way he, he would do it. <laughs> yeah. My friend, Abbas, because they're, they're Muslim. Muslim, Muslim witch doctors. Yeah. yeah there's Americans. So, but then that guy is now one of our neighbors, that witch doctor. Mm-hmm. Really? And uh, my dad, when he came out in 2016, actually, this guy came to him, to my dad, and said, hey, in my village where I came from, could you start a church? Because they really need to know. Uh, about the gospel. Now, I can't because I make a business out of witchcraft. You know, I can't come to no place. Yeah. My whole family. So his family, actually, his. It's a wow. his, yeah. So it's really kind of, kind of full circle. I didn't know that was going to happen, but that's I was scared wild. to death that day when I was, I went to a witch doctor, you know. <laughs> that's not great. something Pastor Rob taught us <laughs> no, in, <laughs> in the college. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> So, so you guys are your home for right now. Mm-hmm. Till December. Home in North Carolina. Yeah. And then what's, what's the future? What's the plan? Oh, okay. I'll take that one. So um, we're planning on going back in December. Okay. And then um, 
we plan on staying there till 2025. Our oldest daughter, she's 15 right now. She's a sophomore. Um, so she'll graduate in 2025. And mm -hmm. then um, as of right now, what we have kind of been planning and feeling peace about is maybe leaving Togo in 2025 and going to a new field in West Africa that is unreached because our passion is to go where Christ is not known mm -hmm. or named. And and that was the case in northern Togo. And it, I mean, it still is, really. The work could go on forever. But there's enough missionaries there, enough establishment there now, and churches and Togolese Christians. And churches that are planned churches. Right. That mm -hmm. we we feel like, okay, if somebody's searching, really searching, they could find him yeah. there, find Jesus there. Mm -hmm. um, but there are so many places that don't have any missionaries in, in Africa, in West Africa, French-speaking, Muslim. That's still kind of our goal. So if we came back in 2025 and, and set the groundwork for a new field and I would uh, try to get my dental hygiene degree while I'm here so that I could actually use that even if it's like a closed access country yeah, type thing yeah, to get yeah, in. Yeah. That's and we're cool. really praying too if this gets out there it'd be nice that we're praying for another family or another yeah. single okay. to go with to a new field mm -hmm. um, even if it's a new person since we've been on the field a little bit mm -hmm. we'd love for someone from our area similar background as us to be able to go and open a new field with us so that's yeah. really our prayer probably the hardest part of the process mm -hmm. is going to be finding that, that person. Yeah. And I know that's one of the uh, burdens and, of my and heart. And God could change our hearts. Like, mm -hmm. we're totally open. If God wants us to stay in Togo until yeah. we die, that's fine, too. But for now, we're feeling at peace about that. Mm -hmm. Cool. Wow. Cool. Okay, I well, think we've is, run out of yeah, time. Yeah, this has we? been good, yeah. though. Yeah. And there's a lot uh, to ask you. Now, you, you guys mentioned, I'm going to throw this in real quick. You had Pastor Rob as a yeah. professor. I had Dr. Ashburn, mm -hmm. who is your aunt. Yeah. And was one of my greatest influences, yeah. someone that I really uh, loved and appreciated. So that's pretty cool. You do have a, a great uh, family background, heritage. family heritage. Yeah, uh, the Drakes and, mm -hmm. and Dr. Ashburn, and so a lot, you know, a lot of history there, which yeah. is great. Mm -hmm. um, well, we appreciate you guys being here with us. Of course, we just recently had our missions conference, and you can learn more about our missions program here at Tried Baptist at tbcnow.org. And if you want to learn more about the uh, Drakes ministry, yeah. where can we go? Yeah, you can write us at drake at abwe.cc, which is our email address. Uh, we also have a voice over IP phone number if you better text in and call in, 336-447-3560. Yeah. There's a Hope Radio mm -hmm. website also, or a Hospital of Hope website, and um, we can get you that information. Yeah, also. that'd be awesome. All right, we'll continue to pray for you, yes. you guys, and your all ministry. Right. And Wonderful. Thank you. Thank and, you for uh, coming. Thank you all for joining thank us. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, we'll Great. see you on our next episode. Thanks for joining us this week on TBC Today. We want to connect with you, so make sure to visit our website, tbcnow.org, and subscribe, rate, and review the show in iTunes, Spotify, or Amazon Music. Don't forget to share this episode with a friend and be on the lookout for our next conversation.